Side 1, RC 46114, Objective Bajor, by John Peel. Copyright 1996 by Paramount Pictures. Read by James DeLotel. This book contains 278 pages on seven sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player in fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the beginning of the book. Library of Congress Annotation. The Hive, a huge starship housing billions of insect-like aliens, is heading for the planet Bajor for fuel and raw material. Within a week, the Bajorans will face annihilation unless Captain Sisko and the crew of Deep Space Nine find a way to stop the powerful invaders. A Star Trek Deep Space Nine novel, 1996. From the book Jacket. Captain Sisko must protect a planet from total destruction. The hive came from another galaxy. Billions of alien beings living inside a vast biological starship. They have already destroyed one planet, converting it into raw material and fuel for their endless voyage through the cosmos. Now the hive is heading for Bajor, and they have given the planet's inhabitants an ominous warning. Evacuate in three days, or die along with their world. The Bajorans would rather die than abandon their sacred home but their hastily assembled military fleet does not stand a chance against the awesome power of the Hive, unless Captain Sisko can penetrate the Hive's defenses and discover their most closely guarded secret. All of Bajor faces extinction. This book is in memory of Harold F. Taylor, now on the greatest trek of all. Chapter One. Target coming in range now, Captain. Captain Benjamin Sisko nodded. Thank you, Major. He leaned forward in the command chair of the USS Defiant and stared intently at the view screen. All weapons to full power. Raise shield. All weapons powered. Kira Nerys glanced up from her panel to Sisko's left. There was a gleam of excitement in her eyes and the more than fleeting suggestion of a smile on her lips. Betty, on your command. Sisko could understand her feelings perfectly. It had been more than a month since any of them had been off Deep Space Nine at all, and it felt really good to be back in space and back in action. Though commanding DS-9 was hardly a simple desk job, it was good to spread one's wings and head out among the stars again. Hold steady. Shields at full, Captain, Chief O'Brien reported from his panel. Thank you, Chief. Sisko could feel the thrill of the hunt now. He watched the forward image intently, waiting for the first glimpse of the... There she is, Captain, Jedzia Dax said. She was seated at navigation, between Sisko and the screen. Her superior eyesight had caught the briefest flicker of movement that he now belatedly noticed. It's a Calderisi Raider, all right, added Odo from his station. Classic configuration, and they've powered up their weapons, too. The shapeshifter was the only one who didn't look eager for this confrontation. That was mostly because he still hadn't mastered the art of shaping his somewhat rudimentary features into semblances of human emotions. They can outrun most ships in this quadrant, Sisko murmured. But they can't beat this one. Open a hailing frequency, he called out. Open, Dax responded. This is Captain Benjamin Sisko of the Federation Starship Defiant. To Calderisi Raider, he said slowly and clearly. You are ordered to stand down your weapons and prepare to be boarded. We have reason to believe that you are running illicit weapons to the Maquis. He gestured to Dax for her to terminate the transmission. Now, he said, let's see what their reply is, shall we? He hunched forward in his command chair, feeling the tension building within him. They've changed course, Odo announced grimly. They are now heading directly for us. He shook his head. Foolish. And typically humanoid. They are also opening fire. The screen dimmed automatically as twin phaser bolts lanced out from the dart-shaped ship that skimmed toward them. The Defiant trembled slightly as the bolts impacted on the ship's deflectors. I think we can take that as a no, 
Kira commented. No damage to shields, O'Brien called. Sisko raised an eyebrow. He hadn't really expected the Calderisi to surrender. They were a volatile species at the best of times, and he had been certain that they were indeed the gunrunners he was after. Still, he hadn't expected them to do anything as foolish as trying to attack the Defiant. Even so, I think we had better defend ourselves, Chief. He spun to face Major Kira. Fire a warning shot across their bow. Across? Kira sounded disappointed. Across, he repeated with a slight smile. For the first one, at any rate. And fire. Kira obeyed. The Defiant shuddered slightly as the phasers lanced out across the void at the twisting raider. Open a channel, Sisko ordered Dax, and stay as close to them as you can manage. When Dax nodded, he called aloud, Sisko to Calderisi Raider. I repeat, stand down or we shall be forced to disable you. I cannot be certain that this will not result in some loss of life to you. Another twin blast of phasers shot from the Raider, again dissipating harmlessly against the shields. Grim, Sisko turned to his Bajoran first officer. All right, Major. Target their engine nacelles and take them out. Aye, sir. Kira replied with a great deal of satisfaction. Her hands flew over the phaser controls. Captain! O'Brien called out suddenly. I'm registering a drop in shield strength. He sounded harried and puzzled. They're down to 95% and dropping. What? Sisko spun to face him. What's causing it, Chief? Brian glared down at the panels. Outside interference, he said. There's some kind of jamming signal coming from the raider. It's causing interference in the generator wave somehow. I've never seen anything like it. Shields are now down to 80%. Cisco turned back to Kira. Now would be a good time to fire, he said gently. I'd agree with you, Captain. Kira agreed, frustration evident in her voice. But whatever's affecting the shields is affecting the targeting sensors, too. I just can't get a lock on a confirmed target. Plus, she added angrily, power levels on the phasers are dropping. We soon won't be able to fire them at all. Best guess, then, he ordered, scowling. Any damage you can do to stop this attack? He spun back to O'Brien. Any idea yet what's causing this, Chief? None, the engineer answered, irritated with the reply. As Major Kira says, all our sensors are being affected, too, so I can't get a straight reading on this thing. Off the top of my head, I'd say it was some sort of modified Delta emitter array. But how they could power one from a craft that small beats me. I could do with a bit of time to study it, say a couple of weeks. He gave a mild grin. Not funny, Chief, Cisco objected. Status? Embarrassed, O'Brien checked his panel. Shields down to 60% and falling. They're coming about, Odo announced. I guess they aim to attack us now. It's difficult to read my instruments, but it looks like they're preparing to fire again. As Cisco watched the view screen, he saw the dark shaped raider heading for them. Twin phaser beams lanced out, slashing into the Defiant. The ship shuddered as the inertial dampers struggled to keep her steady. The lights in the cabin dimmed, flickered, and then settled down to about half their former level. That's it, O'Brien announced. The shields are down completely. The power interference is spiraling around inside the systems now. We've lost the phasers, Kira reported grimly. I'm firing a photon torpedo. She glanced up and managed a tight smile. Best guess, so you'd better hope I'm feeling lucky today. Cisco nodded. There were very few options left to Whatever weapon the Calderisi were using, it was wreaking havoc with his ship. Another run like the last one would destroy them. He watched as the ship on the screen began to turn. Then the picture started to break up as the power levels continued to fall. Damn, he muttered. If he was going to die, he would prefer to stare his fate in the face as he did so. There was the flash of a photon torpedo ejection, and the ship shook with the strain a strain that they wouldn't normally have even felt thanks to the dampers. 
Now it seemed as if the Defiant was falling apart about their ears. Then there was a bright flash on what was left of the picture screen, the torpedo detonation. But had Kira hit the target? For several seconds, everyone on the bridge stared at the screen, holding their breath. Nothing came into sight. Finally, Odo called out, I'm registering debris ahead. The raider was completely destroyed. Well done, Sisko said, sighing with relief. Very nice shooting. Thank you, Kira said with a smile. From where he'd been sitting watching the others, Julian Bashir spoke up. Remind me not to play darts with you today, Major. Even blindfolded, I think you'd beat me. The only one of the crew not smiling was O'Brien. With a scowl, he said, I just wish we hadn't been forced to destroy their ship. He shook his head. I'd have loved to get a good long look at that weapon of theirs. We all would, Chief, Sisko agreed. But under the circumstances, I think we did well just to survive. How are the systems now that the raider is gone? Recovering slightly, O'Brien answered, but not by much. We're going to be limping back to DS-9, Captain. Sisko nodded. I'm in no hurry right now. How long will it take to get the Defiant back up to par when we do reach home? O'Brien shook his head. It depends on how many systems were damaged and by how much, he replied. I can't get consistent readings here. It could be days or even weeks. If we've got the spares, and if there aren't too many repairs on the station to keep my crew busy. I understand. Sisko turned back to Dax. Set course for home. Best speed. He managed a small smile. If you could manage a rough estimate of how long it'll take us, I'd appreciate it. As soon as I can, Benjamin. Dax bent to her task. Sisko saw that her hands, instead of flying across her board as they normally did, lingered in repeated tasks several times. Finally, she looked up. Course laid in and executed. She shook her head. It's really slow, I'm afraid. It's going to take us at least six hours to get back. Understood. Can you patch through a channel back to DS-9? We'd better let them know we'll be late for dinner. I'll try my best. She bent back to her board again. A moment or two later, she said, I've got a weak audio link, Benjamin. It's all I can raise. I'm glad for even that, Sisko told her. Sisko to Ops, can you read me? Ops here, came a faint crackling voice. Your signal is very faint, Captain. Are you all right? Not exactly, Mr. Soika, Sisko replied. We've destroyed the Calderisi Raider, but sustained damage. We should be home in about six hours. Understood, Lieutenant Soika's weak voice came back. Do you need assistance? I could have a runabout out to you pretty quickly. Thank you, no, Sisko said ruefully. We'll just head back under our own steam, licking our wounds. Sisko out. He kept the link. Gazing at the screen, he sighed. The picture was still rather fuzzy, symptomatic of the ship's damage. Still, at least they had survived and stopped the weaponry shipment. Whatever new weapon the Calderisi had, it would be up to Starfleet now to try and track it down and neutralize it. He'd have O'Brien transmit a full report when they reached home. Then the chief was going to be very busy getting the Defiant back into order. Sisko could only hope that until it was fixed, there wouldn't be a need for it. And he knew how weak his chances were that this would be so. On DS-9, crises were the order of the day. Chapter 2 You have betrayed us all and everything that we believe in. Even though he had been more than half expecting this accusation, Tork winced at the words that Harl spat out. There was a pain in his thorax as he faced his oldest and once dearest friend. Harl... It is not like that. Believe me, I have no intention. It does not matter what you mean now, Harl retorted, his anger and disappointment clear on his face. They have sucked you in. In a short while, you will be just like them. And I thought you believed in what we talked about. 
He gave a snort of disgust. I should have known better. How? Enough. As always, Sana's voice was quiet and yet piercing. Despite his mood, Harl subsided. When Sana wanted something, she inevitably got her way, and without undue effort. You are not being fair to Tork, and in your hearts you must know this. You have not given him a chance to explain. Her lips twitched mischievously. And isn't that your main complaint against the Hive Masters, that they will not listen? She gestured toward Tork. Now, here is an apprentice hive master, and you will not allow him to speak. Is that fair? He's not an apprentice hive master, Harl replied sulkily, but somewhat chastened. He's our ex-friend, who's gone over to the side of the enemy. Please, begged Tork, listen to me. Harl, I have not betrayed you. You know very well that my determination was what led me to become a hive master. I did not seek the position. It was thrust upon me. Of course it was, sneered Harl, his nostrils dilating rapidly, showing his disgust. But why? Was it because such elevated positions are hereditary in your lineage? He snorted again. Or because the other hive masters are trying to buy your silence by offering you the post, and expecting you to silence the rest of the student critics as payment... Have they asked that of you yet, or are they waiting until you discover that you can no longer live without all the privileges of the exalted position of Hive Master? Tork knew that it was mostly Harl's anger speaking, but he couldn't help being hurt and irritated by his old friend. Harl, he said, trying to stay reasonable, you know me. You know my commitment to the truth. Surely you must see that I am not going to abandon all that I believe in simply because I have been appointed a hive master. All I see, Harl snapped back, is that badge on your carapace. He gestured at the symbol of the hive that Tork now wore. The badge that we all agreed stands for repression of thought and maintenance of the status quo. How could you? Tork's patience was wearing thin now. Because I believe that there are some hive masters who are not against us, he replied. Because I think that it is not the office that is wrong, but some who hold the position. Because I think that working from within, I can effect changes. Because if the public sees even just one hive master who will listen instead of simply giving orders, then change is possible. Because I think that in this thing, I am right. And you are being a thick-skulled idiot. Harl stabbed out one long bony finger, quivering with anger. Perhaps... Just perhaps you believe that now, he snarled. But it will not last. Remember your precious texts. Power is its own reward and curse. He grimaced. Or have you already forgotten all of your studies? I have forgotten nothing, Tork answered, striving to keep his temper. But you, it appears, have forgotten one thing. Our friendship. Friendship? Harl deliberately turned his carapace on Tork. You have already murdered our friendship. The Tork I once thought I knew and respected is dead. All that is left is a hive master. He spat the last word and then stormed from the meeting room. The door hissed shut behind him. Sana placed a hand on Tork's shoulder. Well, she said gently. That went better than I expected it to. His heart lifted slightly at her touch, as they always did, but it could not ease the pain he felt. He would not listen, Tork said bitterly. He did not try and understand. Laughing, Sana shook her head. Harl? Tork, now who is having unreasonable expectations, you know what he is like. Anger consumes him too often. She shook her shapely head. But it will not last. The flame that burns brightest dies fastest, she quoted. His anger will be gone shortly, and he will begin to think again. I hope so. Tork gave a long sigh. I know it was foolish of me to expect otherwise, but I had hoped. Yes, Sana said gently. 
And that is where you are so different from Harl. You hope. You work hard and strive for reason and change. Harl simply wants to sweep away the old and bring in the new. And this is not possible. Your way is the better way. It warmed his thorax to hear her speak so well of him. Then you approve of my acceptance? He asked eagerly. Sana smiled at him. I have always approved of you, Tork, she replied. You are a calm, reasoning, and caring individual. She touched his carapace again, and Tork felt a thrill of mingled love and lust pass through him. And you are my hope. It took a great deal of self-control for Tork to quash the burning feelings within him. Though he had undergone his determination and was now officially an adult, Sana had not. If he made his feelings for her known, it would not only be immoral, but illegal. Perhaps as a hive master, Tork would be immune to such charges as immorality, but he simply could not chance it. It wasn't just the fear of being caught. He knew that Sana would say nothing, even if he were to make unwelcomed and illicit advances to her, but that he could not use his office as a shield for his crimes. After all, wasn't that one of the things that had always most disgusted him about the hive masters? One rule for the hive and one for the masters. He had to be better than that, not only for the sake of his own soul, but also as an example to everyone, especially Sana. She looked at him with her wise eyes, and he was pierced by an arrow of certainty. She knew what he had been thinking. <clears throat> I am sorry, Tork, she told him, removing her hand. I should not have done that. It was wrong of me to test you in that way. You... He started to say, to tell her she had done nothing wrong. She didn't allow him to finish. I was deliberately tempting you she said, smiling slightly. I should have known that you would not succumb. I wanted to, he replied. As an adult, he was morally bound never to approach a single female child. Despite the fact that she was from the same hatching year as himself, Sana had not undergone determination herself, and was thus still technically a child. But you did not, she said fondly. Whatever Harl thinks, you have proven that your sense of honor remains untouched. And as a child, she added ironically, I am allowed to say what you cannot at present. I love you, Tork, and want to be one with you. She held up a hand. Do not say anything. Yet. Tork understood once again how much wisdom she possessed. Sana always knew exactly how far to go. She had effectively promised herself to him, without compromising his morals. With her love and his new position, he had almost everything he had ever desired from life. Do you have any idea when your determination will be? He asked her. Of course, it was supposed to be a surprise. His certainly had been. But there were always ways that the news could get around. Within the next few cycles, she replied. And I also suspect what the outcome will be. Seeing his amazement, she laughed. Do not be so naive, Tork. Some determinations are quite obvious. Most, in fact. Mine was not, he answered. Perhaps. Sana's lips twitched again. But it is not exactly unexpected. I believe you will make an exemplary hive master. Perhaps the first such in several centuries. Her support and love made his thorax warm again. Tork fought down his emotions, striving to be what she expected of him. And what do you believe your determination will make you? he asked. An astronomer. If she had told him that she was expecting to become a sex provider, she couldn't have shocked him more. And... Astronomer, he gasped weakly. You can't be serious. Why not? Sana cocked her head to one side and regarded him evenly. It's an unpleasant job, agreed, but a necessary one. 
especially now. But you... Tork struggled weakly with his prejudices. Sana, how could you? It is because I can that I expect to become one, Sana answered. If this disgusts and repels you, I am truly sorry. She smiled ruefully. That is one reason, beyond the impropriety, that I did not wish you to declare your love for me. If you no longer wish to associate with me, I will understand. It might be poor for your public image. My image be damned, he snapped back, still struggling to accept the idea. And my feelings for you have not changed. Of course they have, Sana said simply. I understand. Well, I do not, Tork told her, bluntly and with candor. I do not understand how you could wish to be an astronomer. He almost choked on the word. But he took a deep breath. If that is what you wish to be, then I will do all I can to support your decision. I may not understand it, but I do not care about that. I will try to understand. He drew on every ounce of courage he had and tried to reinforce his hearts. Show me. Sarna stared at him in something like alarm. Talk. There is no need. There is a need, he said almost roughly. If this is to be your chosen pathway, then I will be forced to share it with you. I must understand it. Show me. She bowed her head slightly. It is not wise, she replied. Love is not always wise, he told her. So be it. Sana raised her head, and he could see the love in her eyes. Ah, if not for the boundary that separated them, what passions they could share this night. Very well, she agreed. Come with me. She led him through the web of the student quarter. Tork followed, trying to steel himself for the ordeal that was ahead. He was scared. There was no point in denying that, either to himself or to Sana. But he had to do this, for both of their sakes. They left the more traveled byways, and Tork knew they were coming close to the wall of the hive. Their destination was an almost empty room. The walls, as always, were metal. But these had no decorations or furniture. The only thing in the room with them was a small control panel. As she locked the door behind them to prevent accidental intrusion of the unprepared, Sana turned to Tork. I love you, she told him. You do not need to do this for me. I will understand and respect you without this. I know that you will, he agreed. But I do this for us, and I will not respect myself if I do not share it with you. Sana sighed and bowed her head in acceptance. Very well, she agreed. She crossed to the control panel, her hands hovering uncertainly above it. Try hard to endure this, my love. He didn't dare speak. Instead, he simply gave a single curt nod. Her fingers danced over the controls. The wall in front of them both began to iris open. Panels slid back into their recesses with a hiss. As they moved, the lights within the room died down. And the stars became visible. Thousands, perhaps millions of stars, littered across the whole vast space in front of Torque. Stars that burned with beautiful, entrancing intensity. Stars that went on without end to the openness of space. Torque felt the vast emptiness beyond the fragile, transparent shielding, reaching out from the stars and into the core of his being. The openness pierced his soul. The immensity of it all overwhelmed him. Striving to escape the vast nothingness, he shrieked, then curled reflexively into a fetal ball, his carapace sealing off the universe within and sealing him safely within his own being. And still...
Still, he kept on screaming at the nothingness beyond the vast metal womb of the hive. Chapter 3 Gods, how I hate this job. Gariah looked up from her science station at the captain of the Cardassian science ship Vendikar. He was, as usual, pacing like a caged animal up and down the walkway beside her. This was not the first time that she had heard his complaint, and she strongly doubted it would be the last. Tack was a handsome young officer, with a sleek neck and very nice eye ridges. But he was, after all, both career military and something of a loser. A shame, really. He might otherwise have been at the very least an interesting diversion on this routine mission. This is an important task we perform, Gariah said diplomatically. Mapping the positions of a bunch of stupid rocks, he spat, gesturing to the asteroid belt on the ship's view screen. It's dull, it's pointless, and it's eternal. Though she too felt bored by the routine, Gariah felt compelled to defend their mission. We have to be able to chart safe paths through the belt, she pointed out. The rest of the bridge crew wisely remained outside this discussion, finding their instrumentation suddenly fascinating. They were, no doubt, listening to the exchange very carefully. Though Tack was flapping his mouth foolishly, Garaya had no intention of saying anything that might cost her if it was reported back to the wrong people, as it inevitably would be. How Tack had lasted this long with such a negative attitude was inexplicable to her. Why? he demanded histrionically. We're on the edge of Cardassian space here, virtually on the rim of the galaxy. There's nowhere out there to go to. He gestured at the screen. Just more empty space. And if we had to come out here for any logical reason, we could just go around this stupid belt. No, this is just punishment work for us. He laughed bitterly. Gariya knew he'd probably had a drink or two before coming on duty. It was getting to be a habit with him of late. The longer this mission lasted, the worse he became. Another sign of a loser. Well, I know what I'm being punished for. What's your crime, science officer? Gariya managed a slight smile. Curiosity, she replied, lying slightly. I find this fascinating, so I am assigned to the job. Since the captain seemed to be quite talkative, she decided to probe further than she usually bothered. And what was your crime? Foolishness, Tack replied. The crime didn't surprise her, but his admission did. He gave another of his barking laughs. I thought I was outside the usual backstabbing. He gestured at his chest. You wouldn't think to look at me that I was once Gul Gavran's most trusted assistant, would you? No, Gariah thought. Yes, she lied. You are obviously very capable, Captain. Well, I was, he went on. It was hard to tell whether he'd heard her reply or not. I was his favorite and thought I was untouchable. But I forgot the most important rule in the Cardassian military. No matter how much your commanding officer likes you, he likes his rank much better. Tack made another spitting sound. When he was accused of a poor decision, I was the one he blamed for making it, even though I had advised strongly against it. Somehow, that record was expunged. He glowered at Gariah. And I was reassigned. The story didn't surprise her. She knew what it was like in the Cardassian military. Actually, he was lucky he hadn't simply been executed. That was the sort of barbaric punishment they usually went in for. If he was still alive and working, no matter how pointless the task, he must have had some political connections remaining. She shrugged elaborately. And if you perform this task well, she said, you will undoubtedly be given a better one. Ha! Tack snarled. Mapping more rocks, no doubt. He slammed his right fist into his left palm. I want to be out there, hunting the damned Marquis, not babysitting a bunch of female scientists. He glared at her. No offense, science officer, but I hate being here. And we hate having you here, she thought. 
she was saved from having to invent some polite response by the navigation officer. Captain, he called, I'm picking up something odd directly ahead of us. Tack spun around. Identify, he ordered. I'm sorry, sir, the navigator answered, his face twisted with puzzlement. It does not conform to anything I have ever seen before. Tack whirled back to Garaya. Science officer, why didn't you spot this? Because you were talking to me, you idiot, she thought. Ignoring his stupid question, Garaya studied her instruments. Her eye ridges raised in astonishment. Whatever that craft is, she said slowly, it is unlike anything we have ever encountered before, or heard of either. Returning to the command seat, Tack glared at her. I'd appreciate a few details, he told her sarcastically. What are you talking about? Forward scanners, Gariah ordered. Sector 394 Green. The navigator obeyed her command, and the intruder sprang to life on their screens. Gariah had always been very curious, and had spent hours studying data from many alien species. What she saw displayed now on the Vendikar's screens reminded her mostly of a Terran fish called a manta ray. The craft had a large central body with wide spreading wings. Behind it trailed a long tail-like antenna. Tack frowned. It has a most unusual configuration, he agreed. But it is not unprecedented, surely. The shape? No, Gariah commented. But the size? She let her eyes stray back to her instrumentation. Captain, that vessel is approximately 8,000 miles long, and the wingspan is about 12,000 miles. We are still almost an hour from its present position at current speeds. Tack paled, his eyes riveted to the screen. 8,000 miles, he repeated in awe. He shook his head in disbelief. What kind of a craft is it? he asked. Gariah shrugged. She was almost as awestruck as he, but she refused to allow her scientific training to suffer as a result. Captain, the central core of the vessel is 8,000 miles long and approximately 100 miles in diameter. That gives an interior surface area of over 2,650,000 square miles. That is the size of a moderate continent. Bored and slightly drunk though he might be, Tack wasn't stupid. You mean that ship is some kind of colony vessel? He asked, leaning forward and staring hard at the image in front of him. It would be a logical assumption, agreed Gariah, and one probably containing several billion inhabitants. Tack gave a sharp intake of breath. Then we had better deal with it now, he decided. He spun about to face the communications officer. Relay a message back to Central Command on Cardassia with all of the information we currently have, he instructed. Inform them that we are moving in to contact the alien intruder. Without waiting for acknowledgement, he turned back to the navigator. Plot an interception course, he ordered. Maximum velocity. Then he turned back to Gariah. Get me as much information on the thing as you can before we reach it. I want to know exactly what we are dealing with here. Specifically, look for indications of weapons capabilities. Man, thought Gariah in disgust. It's about time he finally got around to attacking it. Acknowledged. Trying to hide her feelings, she turned back to her instruments and began coaxing as much information out of them as she possibly could. Whatever that vessel was, it had clearly come from outside the galaxy. A quick backtrack of its probable trajectory showed that much. Assuming it had taken an energy-conserving course, the computers estimated that it must have come from one of the Magellanic clouds. And if it had crossed the galactic void at the low velocity it was now employing, then the journey must have taken the inhabitants almost half a million years. The figures were almost mind-numbing. Whoever the inhabitants of the craft were, they could not have had contact with any other species in that time. But that was about to change. Within the next hour, the Vendikar would be approaching it. 
Garaya worked hard, poring over her instruments, trying every last trick she could think of to gain even a meager amount of extra data from them. Finally, she stood upright and approached Tack. Transfer of data is complete. I've gathered as much as I can at this range, she announced in a quiet voice. If the captain wanted the rest of the crew to share her findings, he'd tell them. To learn more, we'd need to go inside the craft. So, he asked her pointedly. It's an extremely old craft, Garaya answered, striving to keep her irritation with his brusque manner in check. Somewhere in the region of half a million years old. Its origin would appear to have been in one of the Magellanic Clouds. It has spent most of its life crossing the void to arrive here. Those big wings are dust-gathering devices. Their size is dictated by the need to gather the finely scattered dust in extragalactic space. This is undoubtedly turned into energy and raw materials inside the vessel. She shook her head. It would need to be a very efficient system. The craft is proceeding at sublight speed. Given the construction of the vessel, I would not expect it to be able to exceed that velocity. To accelerate faster would undoubtedly tear the wings apart. We are therefore looking at a very slow, ponderous ship. We could literally fly rings around it. Tack tapped his fingers impatiently on the arm of his seat. And the weaponry I specifically asked you to investigate? He asked. Garaya paled with anger, but kept her voice even. I am unable to detect any weapons. Our sensor devices cannot penetrate the alien ship's hull. I cannot even get a reading as to what the hull is composed of. For all I know, the aliens could be completely defenseless, or able to blast us out of space without even thinking about it. That isn't a great deal of help to me, Tack snapped. Garaya shrugged. It's the best I can do, for the moment. She gestured at the manta ray image. The sensors do indicate that there are openings at the prow of the vessel and several along the body of the ship. These are presumably airlocks and entry ports. Once we are closer, I might be able to get a scanning beam inside one of these and obtain some of the answers that you require. Until then, there is nothing that I can do. Very well, growled the captain. He leaned forward in his seat, staring intently at the screen. If that is all, then you may return to your post until you can get me further facts. When she didn't move, his eyes flickered over her. Well? There is one thing that does puzzle me, she added. That vessel must have smaller ships within it, surely. Explorers, shuttles, and perhaps even war vessels. So? Well, she replied, her unease growing. After half a billion years in the void, wouldn't you have launched some small ships to explore the first solar systems that you have ever seen? She pointed to the screen. Yet they have not. Why not? Tack considered her question and then nodded. A good point, he conceded. His eyes narrowed in concentration. Their ship has been on a very long voyage he suggested slowly. Perhaps not a successful one. He was clearly having the same thought that had crossed her own mind. You think, then, that there may no longer be any inhabitants within the vessel? It is one possibility, he agreed. He abruptly gave her a smile. I recall reading a story once in which the inhabitants of a generation starship reverted to savagery. When their ship reached its destination, they had become uncivilized louts who couldn't even operate an airlock door. That is another possibility in this case. After all, a great deal can be forgotten in half a million years. Indeed, she agreed. Or, of course, learned. Perhaps they have entered a new stage in their evolution and no longer need machinery to do their bidding. She gave the captain a smile of her own. I have also read such speculative fiction. Tack nodded. Well, all we can do is wait, he said. In a short while, we will have all of the answers we need. He turned to face the communications officer again. 
Open a channel using as wide a band of frequencies as you can to the ship ahead of us, he ordered. Send our identifying code and demand a response. Inform me immediately of any reply. He turned back to Garaya. And now we wait, he said. There was a gleam in his eyes. As she returned to her station, Garaya smiled to herself. This was certainly far more interesting than scanning rocks. And Tack seemed to have dragged the shreds of his personality together. Whatever happened now, he would be pleased. Their routine punishment mission had suddenly become something very important. If he handled it well, it would put him back in favor with the military. And if he handled it badly, then he would die. Either result would probably suit him much better than commanding survey charting. As they continued their approach, Goraya scanned and rescanned the ship, trying to eke out just a little more information. She didn't have very much luck, however. The vessel guarded its secrets well. As she couldn't penetrate its skin, she had no way of knowing whether they were approaching a floating cemetery or a mobile fortress. The uncertainty was wearing on her nerves, and she suspected that none of the crew was immune. Every now and then, Tack would start wrapping his fingers nervously on his command chair arm. Then he would catch himself and force himself to stop, only to begin again a few moments later. Then finally there was a change. Captain, she called urgently. The sensors register the opening of the main portal in the craft. Tack glanced at the screen. I see nothing. Fool, she thought. The prow of the craft was a hundred miles across. One small portal, a mere two hundred feet across, wouldn't be visible at this distance. I'm registering smaller craft emerging, she announced. Twelve of them, in a very loose formation. She tried bouncing a sensor beam past the craft and through the airlock, but it dissipated rapidly. Then the portal irised closed again. Damn. Still, now she had something other than the main ship to play with. She turned the sensors onto the smaller craft. Each is approximately 80 feet long, she called out. They're a lot more fragile than the main ship, and... Captain, each vessel is armed. I'm reading energy weapons powering up. Sound alert, Tack ordered, his eyes dancing with joy. He was in his element now. Raise shields. Power the weapons systems. The weaponry officer moved swiftly to obey. Garaya frowned. She understood the need for this move, and she had no qualms about combat, but she hated to see the loss of research material. Any response on our hail yet, Tack demanded. No reply at all, Captain, the communications officer called back. I'm running it again with greater variation in frequencies, and... Captain, incoming signal, audio only. That's better, Tack said with satisfaction. Put it on the speakers. There was a second or two of noise while the translation computer hooked into the signal and scanned it. Then the noise cleared into words. Approaching craft, identify yourself and your purpose. Tack scowled. This is the Cardassian vessel Vendicar, he answered. Identify yourself. We are the Hive. The voice was neutral without any apparent emotion. You are entering Cardassian space, Tack said bluntly. You will not do this without permission. Bring your ship to a halt and prepare to meet us. There was a slight pause. Unacceptable, the voice finally replied. We will continue our journey. You will not attempt to interfere. Sitting up straighter in his chair, Tack snapped. You will not be allowed to enter Cardassian space. Halt your vessel now, or else we will be compelled to use force. This contact is terminated, the voice commented coldly. The carrier went dead. Garaya scowled. How do you propose to stop that craft, she demanded. We could detonate every weapon aboard our ship and still not even dent its hull. They do not know that we are alone, Tak told her. They will not risk beginning a conflict without further information. All we have to do is hold them off until reinforcements arrive. Gariah was about to dispute that assertion, but was saved the trouble. Incoming vessel, the navigator announced. 
They have powered up their weapons for the attack. Ready response, Tack ordered eagerly. He looked like a wild beast who had just been set free from his cage and smelled a victim ahead. Steady all weapons. Garaya watched as two of the small craft came spinning toward them. She kept a sensor lock on them, waiting to see what kind of weapons they would be using. They were both much smaller than the Vendicar and probably less well armed and armored. This attack was both unprovoked and foolish. There was no way at all that it could succeed. She died with that last thought on her mind. The two ships whipped past the Vendicar on opposite sides. There was no sign of any energy discharge, no sign of any weapons system being used. As their pass was completed, however, all that was left of the science vessels were tiny shards of metal and plastics and smaller pieces of flesh that spread out in ever-widening circles, all that marked where the Vendicar had been annihilated. Chapter 4 The operation was a complete success. Hive Master Drawn glanced up sharply from his position at the conference table. He shuffled his report comp rather ostentatiously until Hive Master Picat subsided. Picat cast his eyes down to the floor. I am sorry for my overt enthusiasm, he said quietly. It is good. Drawn allowed a small smile to creep across his face. And it is in part at least understandable. Your fledgling force has done very well. But we shall hear your report at the correct time, if you please. He gestured to one of the two empty seats at the table. The cat, still humbled, sat beside his thirteen other colleagues. Now that he had complete attention, as he always demanded, Drawn could begin the meeting that he had called. He nodded to the person on his right. You may commence recording. Every deliberation had to be kept for posterity. After all, they were at the most crucial point in the history of the Hive, and Drawn had every intention of being recalled by future generations as a great visionary and savior of his people. I see that we have one member missing. He pretended to think for a moment. Ah, yes, our junior colleague, Tork. He sends his apologies, Grand Master, explained Boran, two seats to Drawn's left. He is currently with a medic. Nothing serious, I trust. Drawn had plans for the young rebel, and he didn't want them ruined by an untimely sickness, or worse, death. Boran cleared his throat. I understand he was looking at the, uh, stars, and was taken ill. There was a murmur of surprise and irritation around the table, which Drawn cut off with a wave of his hand. I am sure Tork must have had a good reason for his actions. When he recovers, he will undoubtedly explain. Privately, Drawn already had a good idea what had happened, but there was no need to go on the record with that. So, to the point of this meeting. He looked slowly at the expectant faces around the conference table. As I am sure you are all quite aware, we have now entered our target galaxy. The crossing is complete, and we can now commence the next phase in the great design. He waited a moment for this to sink in, to see that there were no untoward displays of emotion. Though several attendees looked almost ready to burst with pride and joy, they wisely suppressed any outbursts. Nodding his satisfaction, Drawn turned to Primon. Hive Master Primon, how has the hive borne up under the journey? Primon was something of a fatuous fool, but he ran a tight department. His engineers were in charge of the structure and operation of the hive. As you know, he began, for the past several months, my engineers and I have been going through the hive with the greatest of attention to even the smallest details. We have checked out all of the primary, secondary, and tertiary systems. He permitted himself a slight smile. And in many cases even the functioning of children's toys. He patted his report comp. The statistics and results are all compiled here and will be duly fed into the official archives. To avoid boring you with the facts and figures, though, I can summarize our findings quite simply. 
The hive is in far better shape than even the first hive founders could have predicted. Our people have taken good care of our world, and we have survived the crossing remarkably well. There are, of course, some repairs that need to be undertaken, but remarkably few, and none at all in any critical systems. Drawn cut him off before he could keep his almost endless flow of prattle going. It seems that every member of the Hive owes you and your staff a tremendous vote of thanks, Primon. You have managed no small miracle. Dran addressed the meeting at large. I move that we register a strong message of approval for the marvelous work that the engineers have done, both in our generation and in all previous ones. Agreed? There was, of course, a chorus of approval. Excellent. Dron turned back to face Primon again. So, we are in good shape for the next phase of the great design? We are in excellent shape, Primon replied, preening himself happily. It was remarkable how little it took to please some people. Dron sighed mentally. A few words of praise, and Primon was ecstatic. Ah, oh, well, perhaps it would keep him silent for the rest of the meeting for once. Commendable. Dron turned to Boran, the head of industry. Your report, Hive Master Boran. My departments are all ready, he replied. As soon as the raw materials become available, then we can commence the next phase. Good. Dron faced Macon. And what of your department, Hive Master Macon? Macon cleared his throat, somewhat embarrassed. He hated to be dragged away from his work for these meetings, and was obviously looking forward to the end of it so he could scuttle back. Science is mobilized, he answered. We are, uh, working triple shifts at present to, uh, analyze all details. He gestured to his comp. All the details are here and will be, uh, fed into the report. Summarizing, though, we have already discovered one, uh, target world that appears perfect for our requirements. Tapping the controls before him, he called up a holographic projection of the area of space they had entered. Several dozen stars showed up, and Macarn zoomed in on one. This resolved into another picture showing the yellowish star and six orbiting planets. The fourth world of this system has all that we require for the next phase. And how long will it take us to reach it? Dron asked patiently. The course corrections have already been fed into the guidance systems, Macarn answered. The computers indicate that we shall reach the target world in three days. He coughed. Ah, of course our smaller vessels will be able to make a better determination within two. Thank you. Dron had already known these facts and approved the course change before the meeting had begun. The gathering wasn't to inform him, but the other hive masters and posterity. Pacat, it is your turn now. Pacat nodded, barely able to contain his excitement. As we entered this star system, we were challenged and then attacked by a warship from a local race. They called themselves Cardassians. Despite this unprovoked attack, our warriors were able to defend themselves and annihilate the aggressor. If this is symptomatic of the reception we will get, then clearly the local species are warlike, aggressive, and no match at all for our technology. Drawn was more than happy to let him brag about his department's success. It established in the record that they were not the aggressors. Not that it mattered, but Drawn did like the slight moral edge it would give him. He had already altered the records of the transmission from the Cardassian ship to agree with Pakat's propaganda. And our pilots suffered no ill effects? None at all, the cat said happily. They functioned perfectly. Forgive me. This was Hive Master Hosir. He was the oldest among them, almost twice Dron's age, and the only member of the masters whose motives and responses Dron couldn't predict with any certainty. I do not quite understand this. Are you telling us that several of your young pilots flew an attack mission outside of the hive and came back utterly unaffected by their experience, while one of our own exalted members, he gestured at Tork's empty seat, 
couldn't even look at the stars without becoming very ill? Yes, replied the cat eagerly. You see, the pilots in my craft never actually looked into space. With the help of my colleague Boran, we simply manufactured fighter craft without any external portals. All of the piloting was done by the crew using computer simulations, and it worked perfectly. To all intents and purposes, the pilots were simply undergoing another training exercise within the hive. Osea nodded. I see. Pardon my question. There is no need to excuse asking a perfectly sensible question, Drawn said. If he hadn't asked it, Drawn would have been forced to do so. He had wanted their rather tidy solution to the problem on record. I feel certain that we are all pleased with the resolution that Pakat and Boran have found to overcome exposure to open space. There was, of course, a murmur of assent at this. Be it so noted, he commanded. Now, if there are no further matters, this meeting is adjourned. Naturally, no one raised any objection to this. As the hive masters filed out to return to their duty, Osir made his weary way across to Drawn. My compliments on resolving the agoraphobia issue. Not expecting a reply, he then limped from the conference room. In a matter of minutes, only Pakat and Raldar remained behind. Raldar had contributed nothing overtly to the meeting, but he was not expected to. He was Drawn's strong right hand and in charge of security for the hive. Off the record now, Drawn said quietly. I am very pleased with your results, Pakat. The weaponry and pilots performed flawlessly. Training will be accelerated, of course, since we now have a target world. Everyone must be prepared. Of course, agreed Paquette. With a happy smile and a low deferential bow, he left the room. A very capable officer, Raldar commented. Very, agreed Drawn. His work is progressing the great design. Now, to other matters. What is this about talk being hospitalized? Has it to do with a female? The security officer smiled. Naturally. Youngsters are often driven to foolish acts when trying to impress a potential mate. But I am assured that he will be released shortly without permanent damage. He looked out at the stars. Drawn frowned. And why did he attempt such a foolish thing? Merely to impress a female? It does not sound like talk. He is normally rather level-headed, if obstinate and filled with misplaced enthusiasm. Ah... Raldar smiled again. The particular female he sought to impress is most likely to be determined an astronomer. Oh, I see. Dran chuckled. That was interesting. He is serious about this female, then? Yes. She has not yet passed determination, so he can't do anything overt, of course. Dran nodded. And Tork is far too high-minded to consider an illicit relationship, even though he knows he could get away with it. Raldar inclined his head. He likes to think of himself as incorruptible. I'm sure he does. The Grand Master considered for a moment. Then I think it's time we corrupted him, don't you? I believe that this female's determination is definitely due. And I have a strong suspicion that she'll be designated an astronomer. See to it that she is then assigned to Team Two. He smiled. I'm certain that Torque will hear about this very quickly and want to change her assignment. Nodding his understanding, Raldar said, And he will request that her determination be changed. Precisely. I, of course, will ensure that it is, so that he and his female can be one. Dron chuckled again. And that first small corruption will begin his descent, Raldar. And the second step. What about that loud-mouthed, rebellious friend of his? Harl? Raldar spread his hands. He's as noxious as ever, claiming that the Hive Masters must be overthrown, preferably with a lot of our internal organs decorating the walls and floors. The security officer frowned. He could be dangerous, 
we should execute him. Dran shook his head. He could be useful. Besides, executing a child would not be good for morale. Until he has passed his determination, we can do nothing to him. I would therefore suggest he also be given a speedy determination. And after that, he looked up at Raldar. Could one of your agents convince him to perform some small but nasty act of sabotage? Preferably one with a small loss of life, say a child or two. Convince him? Raldar gave a sharp bark. I doubt he'll need much persuading. He's ready to do almost anything at the moment. He is doubly frustrated since Torque was made a hive master. As I suspected he would be. Dron considered the matter for a moment. See that this happens, and then arrest him. We shall be forced to stage a trial at the next hive meeting. I think it would be interesting to have Torque's name chosen by accident to conduct the investigation, don't you? You mean him to have to beg for the life of his friend? Asked Raldar thoughtfully. Either that, or force him to condemn his friend to death. Dron shrugged. Either way, we shall have our solution. If he condemns his friend, then Torque will feel guilty, and he'll be easier to manipulate. If he spares Harl, his morals will be compromised, and we shall have him. In a short while, he will be with us in all things. He stood up and collected his cup. And at this momentous point in the great design, it is vital that we be unanimous in our resolve. The future of our species is at stake. We must seize the opportunity we are offered. We must fully exploit the target world to ensure the survival of the hive. Chapter 5 Sisko sidestepped the truck filled with spare parts, managing to slide under the bridge of the Defiant. He stopped, aghast at the mess that met his eyes. Most of the panels had been removed, and it looked as though a midget with an axe and a bad temper had attacked every system in the room. Wiring, connectors, chip sheets, crystals, and circuit boards lay in total disarray. He could only hope that it looked like something very different to Chief O'Brien. There was nobody visible at first as he edged his way across the deck, carefully avoiding stepping on anything. It might only be junk, or it might be vital to the repair of his ship. There was no way to tell. As he approached the navigation console, he finally saw a pair of legs sticking out from under the mess. Chief? he asked, trying not to startle the engineer. Urgh, came a reply, and then the legs slid out. It was quite obvious that this wasn't the chief from the contours that emerged even before the good-looking blonde woman's face appeared. Technician Fontana removed the laser driver from her mouth Sorry, Captain, she said with a grin. It's just me. Sisko smiled back at her and gestured around the bridge. Tell me that this isn't as bad as it looks. You want me to lie to you? She asked bluntly. She brushed hair from her face, making another smudge that joined the dozen or so already there. It's not too good, sir. She pointed over to the science console. I think the chief's over there, she said unless the damn things have swallowed him up, and that wouldn't surprise me. Keep it down out there, a cross voice called from the indicated station. I'm trying to concentrate. There was a flash and a curse, and then O'Brien's head emerged from behind a stack of wafer chips. Bloody Nora, he snapped, shaking his right hand. That hurt. He vanished again under the console. Sisko raised an eyebrow and glanced down at Fontana. Has he been like this long? he asked sympathetically. All my shift, she replied, grinning slightly. He's a walking curse, if you ask me, Captain. Then you won't mind if I take him out of here. Mind? I'll remember you in my will. She grinned wider, assuming the chief doesn't murder me before I can write him. Nodding, Sisko crossed the deck with exaggerated care. Chief, he said in his sternest voice, come on out of there. O'Brien scowled back at him from the open panel. Look, Captain, I'm kind of busy, he complained. Can't whatever it is wait? No, Sisko glowered at him. 
According to Dr. Bashir, you've worked four straight shifts without more than a cup or two of coffee. I'm ordering you to take a break with me. Come on. O'Brien snorted. Typical of him to cause trouble and exaggerate. It was four cups of coffee. He spread his hands in appeal. Look, sir, I've really got a lot of work to do here, and I... And you're getting on your staff's nerves. Cisco finished for him. Chief, I really do appreciate the overtime you're putting in. But you're so tired, you're making mistakes. Take a break, get a meal, and then sleep. He held up a hand to stifle the chief's protest. That's an order. Do you want me to have Odo lock you up in the brig to enforce it? With a sigh, O'Brien laid down his tools and clambered slowly to his feet. No, he said. He'd enjoy that far too much. He wiped off his hands on the seat of his pants. And now that you mention it, I am kind of hungry. He looked over at Lieutenant Fontana. Will you be okay on your own for a while? Okay? Fontana gave him a wide smile. I'll be deliriously happy, Chief. My ears are still tingling from your last bout of swearing. I was that bad, eh? O'Brien managed a rueful grin. Well, don't repair too much while I'm gone. I don't want the captain to think I'm dispensable. No promises. Fontana winked at the chief, then vanished back under the console. They're a good crew, chief, Sisko said, as he led the way gingerly back to the elevator shaft. They'll be fine while you get some rest. I know that, O'Brien said proudly. It's just that there's so much to be done, he added, his shoulders sagging. So much you've already accomplished, Cisco pointed out. How much of the Defiant is back online? The elevator doors hissed shut as they stepped in. Well, we've restored life support and power to most decks. O'Brien scowled. Navigation should be finished in a few hours. Montana's doing wonders there, but weapons are still offline, and the shields are balking a bit. They took the biggest hit from that Calderisi weapon. He shook his head. I still can't figure out quite what it was, but it did a remarkable job of burning out the command systems, even through the shields. Well, Starfleet sent the hood out to the Calderisi homeworld to ask some rather pointed questions, Sisko told him. We may have some answers for you soon. No pressure, Chief, but how long before the Defiant is back up to strength again? The Chief shrugged. Hard to say. We can have her flying again by the end of the day, as long as you don't want phasers or more than minimal shields. Beyond that, well, I'm hoping another two days, but there's always something to bollocks matters up, isn't there? Sisko nodded. I've always felt that entropy was the fundamental ruling force in the universe, Sisko admitted. Still, it's been remarkably quiet these past three days. Maybe it'll stay peaceful till you're finished. I wouldn't want to take odds on that, O'Brien muttered. I doubt even Quark would. Probably not, agreed Sisko. Now, where would you like to eat? My treat, he grinned. There's a new Bajoran restaurant opened on the promenade that does heavenly bat bird stew. Despair gnawed within Sana as she exited the determination center. She gripped her comp fiercely. Its message burned into her brain. Theoretically, the determination was supposed to be the happiest day of her life. She now had a career and was an adult. She could become one, could have a voice in the day-to-day -day running of the hive, and could petition the hive masters in cases of grievance. Except, of course, in the one case that was causing her grief. Sana stumbled away from the center, not paying attention to the others about her who were heading in or out themselves. She stumbled against several of them, too numb to really care, and they were rejoicing too much to notice her. One of the ones she bumped into grabbed her suddenly. Sana started to mumble an apology, and then she managed to focus on the face of the one who held her. Oh, Harl. I am overjoyed to see you too, Harl replied, his lip twisted sardonically. I take it that you have had your determination and that you are so delirious with happiness that you are not paying attention to the paths you take. I have had my determination, yes, she agreed. 
but I have never been so unhappy. What is wrong? he asked. Did they make you a sewage worker? A sex provider? He managed a wide smile. I could live with that determination, though I doubt Torque could. No, Sana answered, too upset to be either amused or offended. I am to be an astronomer. Harl grimaced. Oh, that is bad news. But it is what you expected, isn't it? Actually, it's also what I wanted, she agreed. I prayed to the first hive for this determination. I have always longed to be an astronomer. I love to observe the stars. Sooner you than me, Harl answered. The only thing I'd see if there was a window open to the void would be my last meal hurtling forth from my mouth. He placed an arm gently on the edge of her shell. Technically, since she was now an adult and he was not, he was transgressing. But at this moment, neither of them cared too much, and she was grateful for his touch. So what is so wrong about getting what you wished for? Because I have been appointed to Team Two. Oh. Harl was sometimes foolish, but he was not stupid. He knew what the problem was. And Torque is on Team One, he observed. That is a problem. Then he twitched his nose derisively. Still, now he is a hive master. I am sure that he will have you reassigned. Sana looked at him in shock. He would not do that. Harl grunted. Why not? Because. Sana couldn't believe that Harl was asking such a thing. You know very well that the determination is never wrong. The comp assesses our skills, our personalities, and our abilities, and places us where we shall be most fulfilled and most productive. I know nothing of the sort, he told her bluntly. You know nothing of the sort. You're just repeating what we've been taught. For all we know, the determination could be wrong any number of times. Only nobody complains about it because it is supposed to be infallible. Sana stared at him in utter bewilderment. She had known for years now that Harl was a rebel, questioning most things. But she had never dreamed that he would go this far. The determination is the basis for our society, she said, struggling to keep her head and temper in check. It cannot be wrong. No wonder you'll make a good astronomer, Harl said sarcastically. Your brains are already out there among the stars instead of down on the deck where they belong. Look, he tried to explain. If I told you that the stars were simply illusions, that there was nothing outside the hive, and they were just illuminations placed there to test by belief, what would you say? That you were simply repeating the 604th hive's heresies, she snapped back. Nobody seriously believes that nowadays. But they did then, he pointed out, and with just as little proof for their beliefs as you have for the infallibility of the determination. You are a scientist, Sana, and you have a good brain. So use that brain. Ask questions. Don't simply accept what you have been told. Demand proof of it. Sana shook her head. I would make a poor revolutionary, she replied. I shall have to leave that to you. Meanwhile, I have to break the sad news to talk. She stared at her friend. I know you think he will abuse his power to have me reassigned, but I do not believe he will. He is too moral for that. Harl snorted again. Too moral to change a stupid system in order to be one with the female he loves? I would call that too stupid. Not offended, Sana managed a weak smile. And if he did have my determination changed, you would call that corrupt. Yes, Harl agreed. It's nice being a rebel. You can always find justifications for anything you wish to believe in even if those reasons contradict something else you believe in. No one expects me to be consistent, merely obnoxious. He stroked the edge of her shell. And, despite my temper, I do care for both you and Torque. 
I think he is a fool, but he probably is an honest one. Just this once, I would be happy if he did abuse his power to keep you with him. You belong together. His comp beeped. And I belong in the center, he added. I have been summoned for my determination also. That did cause Sana to smile briefly. Which you do not believe in. So why are you here? Because until I have passed it, I am forbidden to communicate with mature females like yourself. And I do not wish that to continue. Sana looked at him fondly. I wish you success, she informed him. What do you believe you will become? Smiling, he started away. I don't know. Do you think there are any positions for revolutionaries? Anyway, with luck, maybe I'll get to be a sex provider. He shook his tail at her and vanished into the crowd again. Feeling slightly better for having talked with him, Sana returned to thinking about her woes. Harl was wrong to doubt the determination. He had to be. It was just that Harl liked to question everything. He didn't really have any doubts as to the process. He couldn't have. It was the basis of their civilization. Summoning all of her reserve, Sana tapped the code for Torx Comp into her own. She had to meet with him as soon as possible to inform him of her changed status. She had no idea what he would say, but she knew that he would be deeply saddened. Hive Master Torque is not available, the Comp informed her. He had never refused a call from her before. Sana stared at the Comp in confusion. But why not, she asked. Is he ill? No, the comp replied. He is in session with the other hive masters. It is forbidden to interrupt them. Oh. Sana knew what was happening now. It was what she had tried to tell Tork the other day, before he had insisted on staring into space and became ill. She had been doing her observations and knew that the hive was close to its target. Somewhere ahead of them in space was the world that would provide them with everything they needed to implement the great design, and the moment when she would lose Torque forever. Chapter 6 Gul Dukat sat easily in his command chair, watching the quiet efficiency of the operatives inside Cardassian Central Command. There were some thirty-five officers working in the room, but the noise level was low. Dukat disliked unnecessary sounds. His staff knew that and paid close heed to what they were doing and how softly they could carry out their tasks. From this room on Cardassia Prime, the military vessels of the Empire could be monitored and controlled. Dukat enjoyed his time here, at the very heart of Cardassian strength and will. He kept close watch on what was happening through controlled space, and even the occasional problems were more stimulating than irritating. The technician at the communications desk before him half turned in his chair. Incoming message from the Caratan, sir, he reported. His voice was pitched perfectly to just carry to Ducat's ears. On my screen, Ducat ordered, tapping the control to bring it to life. The face of the captain of the ship sprang into view. Report, Ducat commanded. We have caught up with the alien intruder, the captain answered. He looked tense and unhappy. We can confirm the transmission from the Vendikar. The craft is several thousand miles long. Intriguing. Dukat rubbed the back of his left hand absentmindedly. And is it still in Cardassian space? Yes, Gull, the captain answered. But it will cross into the Durain system in just under two hours. There is still time for us to intercept it. Dukat sighed. Be sensible, Captain. What would you do with a vessel that size if you did intercept it? He was pleased to see a chastised expression on the young officer's face. There is still no indication of how the aliens managed to destroy the Vendikar. My science crew has been examining what wreckage we recovered, the Captain replied. All they are able to say is that the ship was literally shredded somehow in flight. Shields did not prevent the attack. It wasn't exactly a lot of information, but Ducat hadn't really expected better. 
Very well, Captain, he answered. Your orders are simple. Follow the intruder, but take no action against it unless you come under attack. Maintain sensor sweeps and observe. Report to me anything that happens. The captain scowled. Understood, he said reluctantly. Ducat glared into his screen. You do not like your orders, he asked with deceptive mildness. Some of these younger captains were quite presumptuous. Standards in the military these days were seriously slipping. It's not that, Gull, the captain said hastily. It's simply that, well, we are going to allow them to go unpunished for destroying one of our ships? Ducat shook his head slightly. What did they teach you before allowing you command of a ship, he chided. They will not go unpunished. However, if you tried to attack them, I have a strong suspicion that the Keratan would end up in small pieces like the Vendikar. He allowed himself a small smile. I'm sure that doesn't appeal to you. It doesn't appeal to me. I'd then have to dispatch another ship to take your place, and that would be a waste of time. As you reported, the intruder is about to enter the Durain system. This will make it a Bajoran problem. Let them attack the vessel and have their ships destroyed. You will monitor the event and record it. This way, we can discover what weapons the aliens possess without your having to lose your life and my having to sacrifice a science vessel. Now do you understand? The captain smiled. Yes, go, he replied, admiration in his voice. It is a sound plan. Of course it is, Ducat informed him. So obey my instructions to the letter. Out. End of side one.